good morning, good morning, good morning, Strangers Home, good morning, Brooklyn Chapel, good morning, all who are uh, worshiping with us this morning. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. This is the time when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I just want to know, is there anybody out there who can declare and testify that I don't need four walls in order to give God the praise? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm excited to get back there. I'm looking forward to getting back to corporate worship. But until that time, I can still give God the praise right where I am. I can still worship him right where I am. I can still send up songs and praises unto his holy name. I can still bless him wherever I am. Why? Because God is good to me wherever I am. Can anybody testify that? I feel somebody in their spirit is resonating with me on that, that knows that God is still good. He is great and so greatly to be praised. His mercy endureth forever. So we can just declare, we can shout, we can decree, God, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. God bless you. I'm just excited about what God is going to do on this day. If you will, go with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just want to say thank you, God, for this day. We thank you for your grace. Lord God, we thank you for your mercy. Lord, we thank you for this time of fellowship. We thank you for this time of being in your word. Lord, we thank you that you woke us up this morning, Lord God. Lord God, and, and awaiting us, even before we uh, opened our eyes, even before we put our feet on the feet on the floor, on the ground. Lord, you, uh, you blessed us with brand new mercies. And Lord, for that we say thank you. We recognize you for being our father, for being a good God, for being a good father. Lord God, we just thank you for that. And even on this day, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather virtually, Lord God, for we're connected by the Spirit of God. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit. Lord, we invite the Holy Spirit. We invite him, Lord God, to rise up within us wherever we are, to rise up and to fill the atmosphere to fill the atmosphere. We give, give you, God, permission in our lives to throw your weight around, Lord God, and to shift and change some things, Lord God. We just want to say thank you, Lord, as we prepare to hear a word from you. I pray, Lord, that you move me out the way, Lord God. Speak a word to your people, a word that will save someone, a word that will heal someone, a word that will deliver and encourage those who hear, Lord God. Let us know that this time now, Lord, your blessing, even now, Lord God, we'll give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. It's in your son Jesus' name we count it done. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. Um, today we're going to be coming from the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke chapter 10. The gospel of Luke chapter 10, um, verses 25 through 28. Verses 25 through 28. All right, we're going to uh, Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 28. All right, now before we before we read those scriptures, allow me just a few moments to kind of tie and recap. I have been amazed at how God has been tying um, everything together and um, really speaking to us uh, in this time. Um, but just allow me just a few moments before we go into the scripture. Last week, we came from the book of Deuteronomy, right? We came from Deuteronomy chapter 11, and we focused on verses 1 and verses 18 to 19. Um, and um, the subject, the topic then was a fixed heart and a made up mind, all right? Now, from the Amplified Version, this is what it says in Deuteronomy. Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God and always keep his charge, his statutes, his precepts, and his commandments. It is your obligation to him. And I'm reading from the Amplified. Verses, verse 18 and, verses 18 and 19 says, Therefore you shall impress these words of mine. This is Moses speaking. 
to the children of Israel. Impress these words of mine on your heart and on your soul and tie them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as bands frontal on your forehead. He said, you shall teach them diligently to your children, impressing God's precepts on their minds and penetrating their hearts with his truths. Speaking of them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you rise up. Now, those were the verses we came from. Our thought again was a fixed heart and a made up mind. And the Lord spoke to us about the importance of having a fixed heart. Um, a fixed heart is a heart that does not shift. It does not conform. It does not become disturbed. It does not change when external pressures or forces or situations happen. All right. It doesn't change a mind that is fixed, a mind that is fixed. It focuses on the savior. And, and when you have a made up mind, just like a fixed heart, it does not shift. A made up mind does not conform. A made up mind does not become disturbed. A made up mind does not shift when external things happen. Whenever external pressures, external forces, external situations, um, voices, when voices show up, look, um, when you have a fixed heart and a made up mind, um, these things don't, they don't affect us. Um, they don't affect us internally. They don't affect what we believe, where we place our faith when we have a fixed heart and a fixed mind, right? Now, now it's important that we declare, it's important that we decree, right? That we have hearts that are fixed, and we have minds that are made up. This is so important because Moses was stressing this and he didn't do it one time. He stressed this repeatedly um, throughout the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the, is the uh, book that where Moses was teaching the children of Israel before they were going back into the, before they were about to go into the promised land, the land that God had promised them. And he had to make sure they had been in the wilderness uh, wandering for 40 years. And here it is around the 11th month before they're going in that he's taking them aside and teaching them, re reminding them of God's laws. And he did so repeatedly because he understood that we have the tendency to forget. We have the tendency um, to let things slip, right? Um, and so he was repeating these things to them. He said, impress it upon your minds, impress it upon your hearts. It's important it, that it that it becomes a part of them um, so that you can have this fixed mind and this fixed heart because he was aware God knew what they were about to get into. Right. They were going to have to fight for the land. So they needed to have they, they didn't need to be afraid. They didn't need to um, live in fear. They needed to live in trust of the one who brought them through the Red Sea, who provided for them in their wilderness situations. So Moses said he was teaching them the laws, all right? And, the, and, and we can sum it up and love the Lord your God, right? Basically with everything that's in you is what Moses was telling them. Love the Lord your God and obey his commandments. Love the Lord your God and obey his commandments, right? Um, and he, he repeated this um, over and over. And not only that, he said, teach your children, he said, teach your children. Um, look, a shaking is happening in, this, in the world today. A shift is happening in the world today. And it's important that we as the people of God have a fixed heart and have a made up mind. You know why? Because there are people who are not necessarily believers, but who are looking for what's stationary and what's unchanging? Look, we as believers are looking for what's stationary and what's unchanging. We know that that's God, right? Um, but there are people who are looking for what's stationary and what's unchanging in these changing times. And our testimony as believers should be that, and look, I'm saying our testimony, not just lip service, but life service. Our testimony should be that God is the unchanged changer that God is the unmoved mover. Hebrews says it like this. He's the same yesterday, 
today and forever. And though, look, though the external may shift, Though you may experiencing uh, may be experiencing a shift in the external, you may be a shifting uh, experiencing a shift in your finances. You may be experiencing a shift in family situations. You may have lost loved ones. You may have uh, relationship problems. You may be tired of being cooped up in your home. Some people are dealing with mental um, issues. There, there are so many things outside going on. And not to mention when you turn on the news and we see what's going on in the world today. There are so many external pressures, but we need to be fixed. We need to be, uh, we need to have a made up mind. In other words, we need to be stable. We need to be stable in all of our ways. And Moses was telling them, love the Lord your God, because there's something about the love of God, right? There's something about the love of God that's able to, to keep us stable, to keep us calm. Right. Little children, when if it's storming outside and they're afraid of it, they're going to go run to mommy's arms or dad or someone. And it's something about the love that mom or dad has that's able to calm them, to give them peace, that even though it's storming outside, even though they can still hear the thundering and the lightning, there's something comforting about the love that your parents can give you. And see, that's how God wants to be for us. God is not just one who loves, but the Bible tells us that God is love, right? Romans 8, 27 and 31. Take a moment and read that in your time. Romans chapter 8, 27 through 31, right? Um, um, and, this, and I'm reading from the Amplified. I'm just going to read a little part of it. It says, and he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because the spirit intercedes before God on behalf of God's people in accordance with God's will. And we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his plan and purpose. Right now, I read that from the Amplified. Anytime you read scriptures, always compare it, uh, compare it to the King James versions to make sure that it's reading the same thing. But we've been talking about um, having faith, right? Trying to tie it all together. Having faith. Faith is having confidence and assurance, right? Faith in God is confidence and assurance about God. And we need to understand about God. We preached earlier that God loves us and his love is shown in his concern for us. He loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. And, and we have to understand that no matter what happens to us, God is able to take it and work it together for our good. See, all of these elements help us to have a fixed mind and a fixed heart. We can't have one without the other. It's important that we understand God in his totality. He's a God who loves. He's a God who's merciful. He's compassionate, but he's also a God who's a jealous God. Thou shalt love no one else but me. He's also a God who can be stirred to anger. We have to understand all these things about God, right? But his love prevails. His love is the defining characteristic. Why? Because he doesn't just love he is love. So Moses was telling the people, see, it's something about the, the, the words, love the Lord your God with everything that's in you, right? And in Deuteronomy 11, he talked about it. Also in Deuteronomy chapter six, make a note, Deuteronomy chapter six, um, verses four, four through nine. Um, he said, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. In other words, the only God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and with all your soul and with all your strength, your strength being your entire being. These words which I am commanding you today shall be written on your heart and mind. You shall teach them diligently to your children. See, Moses kept saying the same thing over and over again, which is why I'm saying it over and over again. It's important. It's important. It's important that in these times, when you look outside what's going on, when you look on the news, when you see what's happening in the world, there's so much that can shift you. 
There's so much that can move you because there's a shifting taking place. But we're being led by God, right? He leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if he's the same and he's not changing, when the world is changing and I'm following God, we're going to be all right. That's when we can have faith over fear. That's when we're able to choose faith over fear. That's when we can choose hope over what's happening outside because we, our soul is anchored in the Lord. And see, that's important. We, God, we have wisdom. We have knowledge, right? We understand stuff. But that, that type of worldly understanding um, will leave you uh, shaken up, going this way and that way. We need, to, and we need to have the understanding, the knowledge, and the wisdom of God. God is the one who gives wisdom. Right. And so we need to be able to take what's happening and 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 let it rest in our souls to say, hey, you know what? But God is still good. When we see stuff happening, it should stir us to pray. It should stir us to act. It should stir us to be the people that God created us to be praying, fasting. Right. And so that this is this is important. And, and like I said, it's important that we. Um, hear these things, it's important that we remember these things. I, I just have to keep repeating it because it's so important. Because when you leave your four walls to go back into, some of us have already started going back, right? People have gone back to work. Um, you look outside, it almost looks like people have forgotten about there's a virus running rampant, right? Um, but, but in reality, things are happening. Things are trying to get back to some type of uh, uh, normal, right? But we have to be fixed. We have to be fixed in our minds and fixed in our hearts. Even so much so, even when we go back to the church, our praise shouldn't be the same. Our worship shouldn't be the same. Because we've spent this time at home studying, um, being faithful to God. Why? Because now you're at home and God is searching the heart. It's not about what you do. It's not about what you did when you were in the church that I was there and I did this because I had a title or I did it. Now God is saying, did you worship me simply because I'm God? Did you still connect with the with what the church is doing? You had excuses before. I couldn't come to Bible study because of this. I couldn't come to Sunday school because of this. So now you had it. All you had to do was cut your phone on. You could have put it on mute and put it to the side. What's your excuse now? It may sound harsh to say, but but can you imagine God asking those questions? Can you imagine God saying those things? And I don't mean, and like I said, I'm not trying to be harsh, but this is the truth. We have to understand God searches the hearts. He doesn't care. Look, you don't have to show up for pastor. Don't do it for me. Don't do it for me because I don't have a heaven or hell to put you in. Don't do it for me, but do it for the one you say you love. And it goes back, love the Lord your God with, oh, Lord, I love you enough to, to get on this phone and put this phone on. Even if I have to work, um, I'll get on, I'll slip on, I'll go to the bathroom and slip on the phone and make a phone call in the other time. So maybe I'll just tune in. Okay, God, I have all this stuff going on, but now you've made it so, see, that's a blessing. Now he's made it so that, that things are on the airwaves all times a day. You can replay it, right? We have no excuse. We have no excuse. We're leaders in the church. We're doing this. We're doing that. Our goal is to save souls. How can we save souls if we don't even want to connect it with the one who's teaching us this? All right. And so and so we have to understand that it's not about um, doing this, like uh, your title in the church. It's not about uh, it's not even so much about the job in the church. If you're a usher, a choir member, a deacon, it's not that does not go above loving God with everything that's in you. And with the way the world is, we want God to heal the land, but we have to get to the point where we humble ourselves. And if we don't understand what it means to love God, how are we going to humble ourselves? Right. So 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 we have to understand that we have to understand that. So this brings us to we're still talking about loving the Lord your God. We're still stuck on that. But now we're going into the New Testament when Jesus talked about it. All right. So Jesus is talking about it with um, a, a scribe. All right. In Luke chapter 10, verses 25. So I want to read it real quickly. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And it says, and behold, 
a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. All right? Now, this, the, the, our thought for today, our subject for today is giving God the right of way. Giving God the right of way. Giving God the right of way. All right? Giving God the right of way. Now, when you think about right of way, when you think about right of way, uh, if you think about driving, right? Right of way, O-F-W-A-Y. The law gives, when you talk about driving, the law gives the right of way to no one, all right? In, in terms of driving, or if you're a pedestrian or whatever, the right of way gives the law, gives the right of way to no one, but it does state who must yield or give up the right of way. It states who must yield or give up the right of way. It doesn't say this person um, has the right to do this. This person has the right. But it, what it does, it tells us who must give up the right of way based on the situation, right? Now, every driver, motorist, pedestrian must do everything they can do to avoid a crash. That should be our mindset. When we're driving, um, we have to be defensive drivers. Uh, we have to be trying everything we can to prevent or avoid a crash. So when you yield the right of way to another vehicle, when you yield the right of way to another vehicle, you are letting them go before you. All right. In the traffic situation. And I love how it reads. You let them go before you in the traffic situation. Few areas of traffic safety are more misunderstood than the yield to the driver on the right rule. This is the rule that controls most intersections when drivers arrive at an intersection at the same time. For instance, you come up on a stop sign at the same time as another driver in a cross street, right? Um, and he is on your right. You yield or give up the right of way to that driver, which means you let him go first. If you reach an uncontrolled intersection at close to the same time, well, the vehicle who actually reached the intersection last is the driver who must yield the right of way. If you go to a four-way stop, whoever gets there last has to yield the right of way, right? So the law doesn't give the right of way to anyone, but it does give the right of way to the one, right? And I'm talking about the law of the Lord, right? See, the law of the land doesn't give the right of way to, to drivers, but the law of the Lord gives the right of way to the one. I'm talking about the one who looks high and looks low, he, he, the, the one who is high and looks low, the one who is above all situations, everything that we can go through, the one who was here before we were here and will be here after we're here. God has the right of way in every situation. When we're driving, we have to yield the right of way based on who gets to the place last. But now if your testimony is God is the one who's leading and directing my path, Lord is leading me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I trust in the Lord. I acknowledge him in all his ways because I, the promise is he'll direct my paths. Well, if that's the case, then we must always yield the right of way to the Lord. You hear me? We have to yield the right of way to the Lord. Now, sometimes now we, let's go back to when you're driving, when you're driving, when you're driving. Sometimes when you come to that four way stop and you see somebody else coming, somebody sometimes we speed up a little bit to try to make it there first so we can go first. Right. Sometimes we try to speed up just a little bit so we can make it to that stop sign. So we'd be the first ones there so we can have the right of way. See, that 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 happens in the law of the land. But when you're talking about the law of the Lord, 
look, we don't want to be the first one there. We don't, I, I don't know about you, but I never want to be the first one there because if you go through the Mosaic law, you have all these things that you have to do. All these things that you have to do to be right with God, right? But Jesus summed it up. He summed it up in two verses. He says, if you love the Lord your God with everything that's in you, and if you love your neighbor as yourself, that's the second one, it sums up all the law. Because if you love God with everything, you will obey his commandments. That's what the word of God says. He said, he said, God said, Jesus said, he said, if you love me, right? That's what the word says now. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. Love is an action, okay? Love is action. Now, when we love God, that's not something that we can actually um, see, just loving God. We can say we love God, but to see, um, if I say, hey, I love God, right? You can't see that. You can't see it just as in me saying I love God. But see, the action part of that is when we love our neighbors as ourselves. When we love other people, see, that's the love of God in action, right? When we put our neighbors first, when we yield to God and treat people how God wants us to treat people, that's the love of God in action. I'll go back to 1 John chapter 4. Go back and look at 1 John chapter 4. Make a note of it. That's, that's talking about, remember we preached about that, um, when God's love lives in us, right? Right? When we live in him and he lives in us, all right, it, 1 John chapter 4 talks, in, talks about um, the action of love of God is actually loving your neighbor. How can, how can you say you love God whom you have not seen and, 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 and not show love to people that you see on a daily basis, right? So, so the law, the law, the law is all here. Jesus was telling this guy, um, and, and see, he's a scribe. See, he's a lawyer, right? Just a little bit about this, this, this section. So this guy, he said a certain lawyer. Now, the lawyer, uh, he was tempting Jesus. He wasn't trying to find the answer to the question. He was tempting Jesus. The, the, this man was an expert in the law of Moses, right? He was an expert. And sometimes they were referred to as scribes. And they studied, they taught, they interpreted, they dealt with the practical questions of Jewish law, both in the courts and in the synagogues, all right? Now, it was not the, when he asked this question, it was not his intention, it was not his intention to find out the truth. That's not why he was asking the question. You, that was not the motive in his heart. That wasn't his motive. He was not trying to discover the way to God. His motive was try to, to try to catch Jesus in a compromising situation. He was trying to cause Jesus to discredit himself by giving some, some unusual answer that would cause the people to rise up, right? But see, this question was still an important question, right? This question should be the most important question for all of us. Um, what must I do? To have how do in other words, how do we inherit eternal life? How do we inherit? Now, now look at the wording, all right? Look at the wording of what he said. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up, tempting him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said, What shall I do? to inherit eternal life, as if he could do something. See, he thought it was about his works. He thought he could, he could uh, be good enough or become good enough to find favor in God's sight. He thought that it was something that he could do, that he would be acceptable because he was good enough. But see, Paul breaks it down to us in Ephesians. Paul says, for by grace are ye saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, Jesus spelled it out clearly for him. He came there saying, what must I do? But Jesus was trying to tell him, no, sir, you have to yield the right of way. 
You have to yield the right of way. It's not what you can do. It's what somebody has already done for you. We have to yield the right of way. Now, let's look at what Jesus said. He said unto him. Now, this is Jesus talking. He's, he asked the question, what is written in the law and how readest thou? All right. So he asked him, what's written in the law? He told him, now let's go back to the law. And this is what the scribe said. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. All right. So he was he was quoting from Deuteronomy chapter six. I think it was the third verse and the 11th verse. He was quoting from Deuteronomy chapter six. OK. And Jesus told him he so he asked the question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus was telling him, it's not what you can do. You have to yield. He took him back to the law because the law has the answer. The answer is love the Lord your God with everything that's in you and thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus said unto him in verse 28, thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live. This do and thou shalt live. So Jesus answered him and said, you're right. Love the Lord your God with everything in your heart. Love the neighbor uh, with everything that's in you and love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, this do. Notice that do is present tense. That means whenever you read that, you should be doing it. In other words, habitually, every day, not just one time, but this should be an everyday habit while you have breath in your body. He said, if you do this every day, thou shalt live. What does it mean to live? Well, Jesus said he came that we might have life and life more abundantly. So thou shalt live. If you do these things, you'll have a good life in the Lord. It doesn't mean you'll have all every 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 material thing that you want. You're not going to have all your wants, but you will have everything that you need. Thou shalt live. And see, if we're not careful, we'll get stuck with living here on this earth. But see, Jesus is teaching about eternity. It shouldn't be enough for us to just live here on this earth with the blessings of God. We should want to go further and beyond. Lord, I want to be with you for eternity. Lord God, I understand that these um, th these few years that I have on this earth is just like a, a puff of smoke. It'll, it'll pop up and then dissipate. But being with you for eternity, forever. And see, that's what a lot of people don't want to realize. That look, this life is not the end. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I just, I just have to say, this life is not the end. That's what I believe. That's what my heart is fixed and my mind is made up. I'm sorry. That, that's, that's where I am. I believe that this world is not the. End. I believe that uh, when I breathe my last breath, that that though my body will be in the ground decaying and breaking up, that's all right. But my soul will be with the Lord. My soul will be constantly joy. Const I'm going to be in a 24-7. I don't know what the time is up there. All I know is I'm going to be worshiping God, praising God, worshiping him. No problems, no pains, nothing going on. No problem, nothing. I don't have to worry about anything. And see, that's what I get excited about when he says, look, if I love God with everything that's in me, if I love my neighbor as myself, if I can simply just deny myself here, I have an eternity with God. And see, if you ever had a taste of the presence of the Lord, you realize, look, there's nothing else that I could have. Uh, there's nothing else that the, the daytime or the nighttime can give me that will compare what is to come. There are no habits. There are no, no hangups. There's nothing that looks or sounds or feels better than the thought of being with God in glory. And see, See, Jesus was always trying to get us to see beyond, to try to get the disciples and the others to see beyond, not just this life, but life to come. And so what do you do? Well, look, how can we go wrong with loving God? How can we go wrong with loving others as, 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 as God tells us to love? If everybody in this world loved people like God tells us to love, we wouldn't have the problems that we're having now. 
We can sit and try to find all the answers and how to do this and do that. But plain and simple, if we receive the grace of God, if we get a glimpse of the forgiveness that God has given us, if we can even understand and even on our best day, we were nothing but filthy rags in the eyesight of God, that, that the wages of sin is death. That is, that's what we deserve. But thanks be to God, the gift that he gave us was eternal life. He gave us eternal life even before we loved ourselves. So much so that he gave his only begotten son that all we have to do is believe in him. His son got on the cross, paid the price, took, took sin, the sin of the world, our sin, my sins, your sins, past sins, present sins, future sins. He took it all. And he, he gave his life up on the cross because they couldn't take his life. He gave up his life. But before he gave it up, he said, it is finished. And gave up the ghost. Was buried three days, but rose again with all power in his hands. Ascended into heaven. Seated at the right hand of the Father. Sent us a comforter, the Holy Spirit, which is God which has the same power as God, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. He sent the Holy Spirit to be with us so that his words, I will never leave you nor forsake you, will resonate in our hearts and we'll know that it's true. And we know we have the Holy Spirit when we have the fruits of the Spirit, when we have love, when we have joy, when we have patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. When we have all those things, it's evidence of the Holy Spirit in us. And when we have the Holy Spirit in us, we have the same power that God has. We have access to it. Not that we are God. But we're instruments of God, created in his image, created in his likeness. We, we, we don't have to uh, work towards victory. We're always standing in our place of victory. Why? Because the Bible says we are overcomers. Why? Because Christ has overcame the world. So why wouldn't we want to yield? Why wouldn't we want to yield when, when there's a God who loves us so much that he said, you know what, cast your cares upon me simply because I care for you. Not because you did anything good or bad, simply because I care for you. Cast your cares on me. Who wouldn't want to, 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 to love a, a God who said, I'll give you peace that surpasses all understanding? Who wouldn't want to love a God who said, I'll replace, uh, uh, you, yeah, you're weeping right now, but you won't always cry. Joy is coming in the morning. Who wouldn't want to serve a God like that? And see, we have the Holy Spirit working in us, but we forget about the Holy Spirit sometimes. We forget about the Holy Spirit because if we were to walk around, if you were a child and you walked around with your parent and you respected your parent, um, there are some things that you wouldn't do because you love your parent and you respect your parent, right? There are some things that you wouldn't do in front of them because you don't want them to see, right? Now, if you weren't around them, then you would probably try to sneak and do some stuff. We've all been children before. We, you know what I'm talking about. There used to be a time when people wouldn't do certain things in front of the pastor or, or church people. There used to be a time now. Now, now, some, now, people will say just about anything in front. It doesn't matter these days. But look, if, if we're Christians and we have the Holy Spirit in our hearts, that means we're carrying God around with us. And see, that should convict us. That should stop us. That should say, you know what? I want to do the best that I can. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. But I know that I have the power in me to overcome temptation. I have the power in me if I would only just access that power. And it all comes about yielding the right of way. We have to yield the right of way, right? We have to yield the right of way. Um, it's important, and, and, and we're pretty much done. Look, in order to yield the right of way, there are three things that we must do. Three things that we must do. I want you to get these three points, all right? Point number one. Point number one. Giving God the right of way requires three things. Number one, we must deny ourselves. 
we must deny ourselves. All right. And next to that, write Luke 9 and 23. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. All right. Number two, not only what, what we, must we deny ourselves, but number two, we must die to self. We must die to self. We must die to self. And next to that, write Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians 2 and 20. And number three, we must live in Christ and his righteousness. We must live in Christ and his righteousness. We must live and circle live in, also circle in, Live in Christ and his righteousness. All right. And the, the verse there I want you to write is also Galatians 2 and 20. All right. It's going to be the second part. All right. I want you to make sure you have those three things. I want you to have those three points because we may uh, we're going to spend some time next week talking about these as well. OK, but I want you to have those three points to meditate on. All right. Now. So. So look, first thing. We must deny ourselves, all right? We must deny ourselves. Um, looking at Luke chapter 10, the, word, the law says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all, A-L-L, -L, all. That means 100%. That means everything, nothing left. In other words, when it comes to my will or God's will, it's always God's will. When it comes to what I want or what God wants, it's always what? What God's want 100% of the time. That's loving the Lord your God with all your heart. Loving the Lord your God with all your mind means that I'm going to think about the things that God wants me to think about 100% of the time. I don't have time to think about what I want to think about or what the world thinks about. And when those thoughts try to pop into my mind, I need to do what the Bible says. Think on things that are lovely, of good report. I'm just trying to help somebody because this is something that we all have to do daily. Daily, we have to do that. So we have to deny our minds, right? Um, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, strength being your inner being, your entire self, right? Loving the Lord your God with everything means we deny ourselves and it's all about God. And see, a lot of times people don't want to do that because it requires submission. It requires submitting to authority. It re re requires yielding to authority. Now, we want everybody to yield to us when we get to those stop signs. But we have a difficult time yielding to God. And see, in this time, I hear God telling us we need to self-examine ourselves. We need to self-examine ourselves. We need to self-examine. The word yield, the word yield means um, to submit to, to bow down to, to comply with, to conform to, to agree to, to go along with, to be guided by. See, that's what the action word, when, when you use yield as a verb, that's what it means to do. So our action in yielding to God should be to submit to God, right? Now, we were familiar with the verse of scripture that says, um, uh, resist the devil and he will flee. But look, you got to look at what comes before that. It says submit to God, right? Then it says resist the devil and he will flee. It goes on, draw nigh to God. It goes on in verse 10, it says, humble yourselves. There are some things that we have to do. That's the condition part. If we do those things, then God provides the promise part, right? We open the door for the promise. So when we yield as a verb, when we yield to God, when we conform to the mind of Christ, when we are guided by God, when we submit to God, when we do those things, and, what, and why would we have a hard time submitting to one who wants to love us? Why would we have a hard time submitting to one who wants to take care of us? 
Why would we have a difficult time submitting to, to a God who wants to, um, on, who only wants the best for us, right? But the word yield also has another meaning. When you use the word yield as a noun, right? When you think about the yield on interest, your interest when it yields, uh, when you get something back or when you're planting vegetables or crops and you yield a harvest, the word yield as a noun means to gain, to produce, to bear, to realize. So think about it. When I yield as an action to God, in God, I also yield. I yield, I, 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 he produces fruit, he, he bears fruit, um, we gain spiritual blessings. So yielding to God affects your yield in God. When you yield to God, you give, the God, you give God the right of way to do what he's going to do in your life, for all things to work together for good, the good stuff and the bad stuff, right? Think about it. When Jesus was on the cross, he yielded his body and gave his spirit the right of way. When, when Jesus was on the cross, he yielded his body and gave the spirit the right of way. He yielded his body. You remember when he was in the garden praying? He said, Lord, not my will, but thine will be done. Do we have a hard time? That's difficult. Look, if we really prayed that prayer and, and we, we always allow God's will to be done, he said, not my will, God, but your will. If Jesus had to submit to the authority of God, what makes us think we don't need to submit to the authority of God? Jesus yielded his body. Look, he took every stripe for your heel, every lash that he took that, that ripped skin from his body. He, he did it so that you can call out to him for healing. Healing in your body, healing in your mind. We have to yield. If Jesus had to yield his body to give the spirit the right, he yielded his body so that when he was going to, he knew he was going to come back. It was in the scriptures. He knew that. But he did so, so that the Holy Spirit would come for us. So that we'll have that power daily. Come on now. When you yield, you give God the right of way. Some of us need to yield. All of us need to yield to God because it's a daily thing. It's a daily thing. We have to yield to God. So we deny ourselves. Luke 9, 23 says, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. If you want to be a disciple, you have to deny yourself, denying yourself, your tendencies, the things that you want, the things that make you feel good, your comforts, your ease, your appetites, the things you enjoy doing. You yield that to God. You say, God, if this is not pleasing to you, remove it, Lord God. I don't want to do it anymore. Lord God, if this action is not pleasing to you, I don't want to do it anymore. Lord, if this behavior is not pleasing, if the words coming out of my mouth don't give you glory, I don't want to do it anymore. That's yielding to God. That's yielding to his authority to, to, to choose and say, look, this needs to be pruned. No, this can stay. This needs to be pruned. No, we yield to God. So we have to deny ourselves. Second, we must die to self. Galatians 2 and 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. When we allow the love of God to live in us, we don't have room for the type of love that we can give, the type of love that's only reserved for those who love us back. So that when we're dealing with situations like this now, we can of racial injustice and all the, the, the pandemic and, and economy and all this stuff. We can look at how God would do things. We can look at it to say, how can I show the love of Christ? Because what's more important than anything else is that somebody's soul is saved. We look at these things. I, I'll treat a person the way I want to be treated. I won't do things to hurt somebody else. When we let the love of God live, when we're crucified with Christ, 
who wouldn't want to be crucified with Christ? Yeah, because you hear the word crucified with. But guess what? Christ already did the work. He already did the work. We simply have to die to ourselves, die to the things that we want, the things that make us happy. And we say, you know what? I want what God wants for me. And how many know that when you when when you do the things that makes God happy, you can't help but to be happy. Why? Because he only wants what's best for you. He loves you so much. He only wants what's best. So we have to deny ourselves. We must die to self. But number three, we must live in Christ and his righteousness. Live in Christ and his righteousness. The second part of Galatians 2 and 20 says, the life I now live in the body, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So when we live in Christ and his righteousness, when we're covered by the blood, when we let the mind of Christ be on, in us, when we allow the Holy Spirit to guide our directions, to con convict our actions and to make us better, that's what that's all entailed in yielding to God. That's yielding to God, right? And that's it. That's it. That's it. We have to yield to God. Love the Lord your God. Love the Lord your God. Love the Lord your God. It didn't say love the Lord pastor's God or love the Lord your mama's God. It said love the Lord thy God. In other words, make it personal. Make it personal. Didn't you see that in the three points? Deny self, die to self, live in Christ. That's, that's something that we have to do personally. Love the Lord. That make, make him your God, not my God. Make him your God. Personal relationship, because that's what it's about. Personal relationship. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy strength, with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. That's denying yourself. That's dying to self. And Jesus said, thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. And see, that's living in Christ and his righteousness. Because the Lord understood that we wouldn't be able to do these things outside of him. The Lord understood that. And see, we have to understand that God loves us and it's all about relationship. God loves us so much and, and, and relationships have to be two part. They have to be two part. God has already done his part and now it's time for us to do our part. The Bible tells us there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. When we're in Christ, when we love the Lord our God with everything that's in us, it compels us. It constrains us. It ties us. It helps us to have a fixed heart. It helps us to have a fixed mind. It helps us to love others with the type of love that God gave us. And when you understand he loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son, when, he, when we realize that even with everything that we've done, he said that, that I'm making a way for you to have forgiveness. You don't deserve the forgiveness because that's the justice of it. A just God says the wages of sin is death, right? But the merciful side of God says, but the gift of God is eternal life. Somebody out there may need to simply accept the gift. Um, whether you're a born again believer or whether you're seeking to seeking to, to uh, a relationship with, a with some, someone that's stable, we all need to fully accept the grace of God and fully accepting his grace is understanding that when we have a, a repentant heart, when we truly say, Lord, forgive me, I want to be better than I am. I want a change of mind, a change of heart, a change in my actions. When we truly say that he's faithful to forgive, he's faithful to perform on a daily brand new mercies, his peace. His comfort, his joy, his, his joy, it's all for you. But the question is, do you understand that it's not about religion, it's about relationship? 
God wants us to have a relationship with him. Re religion, and it, this is not saying that anything is wrong with tradition or anything is wrong with lig religion. But when he says, love the Lord thy God with all, it simply means you put God above everything else. When you put God above everything else, you give it to him to layer it. So that when God moves, we move with him. We say, God, your will, not mine. Because now we see how the world has changed. And now we have to figure out, what do we do? Well, we just simply have to trust and adjust. We trust God and adjust in the way that he's, he wants us to be. We can't go back expecting things to be the exact same way. And that's not something that I'm saying because it's something that I want. It's just how it is. Things are not the same. Things will not be the same. But we serve a God who is the same. So he's already prepared. And we need to, God wants us to give more of ourselves. Look, y'all, it's a, it's a daily thing. It's a daily thing. And we, this is not the time to be beating up on self, but this is the time to accept his love, to accept his grace, to receive it fully. And when we receive it, there's nothing left for us. There's nothing left to control our minds. There's nothing left. Why? Because it's all controlled by love. It's controlled by a love that thinks of others before we think of ourselves. And if everybody thought of others before they thought of themselves, can you imagine what the world would be like? If everybody thought about others before self-interest and trying to gain stuff, can you imagine what the world would be like? See, the answer is love the Lord your God. Now, a lot of people won't agree or believe that, but that's the answer. And my challenge is simply try it. Simply try it. If you love God with everything that's in you, if you love with every, if you treated people how you wanted to be treated, imagine what the world would be. There may be somebody out there who's seeking that type of love. There may be somebody who is seeking that type of relationship with God. There may be somebody who has been in relationship with God, but is saying, Lord, I want a deeper relationship. All of us should want a deeper relationship. Every day we wake up, we should want a deeper relationship with God. You should want to fall so deep in his love that you can't find your way out. I want to pray for you. I simply want to pray for you. But, but before, you even, before we even go to prayer, I encourage you to just simply let it go. Deny self. Let go of... of, of and... and, and you may not feel like you have the power to do it, but you need to make a mind choice to do it. You may not feel it in your heart yet. You may not feel it in your heart for a while, but you need to make a conscious decision by faith that I'm going to let it go. Let the chips fall where they may. Take a chance and trust God. What do you have to lose? What do you have to lose? Take a chance and trust God. Bow your heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just want to say thank you, God. Lord, we thank you for this day, your grace, your mercy. We thank you for this time um, that you've blessed us with, Lord God. We thank you for uh, this fellowship that we have right now. Lord God, we come right now thanking you for, for just being God. Lord God, you're a God to us all, Lord God, but uh, we have to make that choice. We have to make that decision, Lord God, on a daily basis to receive you. Lord God, help us, Lord God. I pray right now for those who are for your children, Lord God. I'm praying for those who have believed and accepted, Lord God, who love you, Lord God, and simply want uh, to grow deeper in their relationship to you. Help us all, Lord God, to yield, to give you the right of way. Lord, help us to give you the right of way in our, in our talk, in our walk, in our actions, in the choices that we make. Lord, help us to yield. So that when we come to a moment and you said to, to pause and to, to self-examine ourselves, Lord God, help us to yield. Help us, Lord God, to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit ever so clearly. As we focus on you, God, as we worship you, Lord God, as we keep our minds on you, help us to hear that, the audible voice of the Holy Spirit. Lord God, forgive us of our sins, Lord God. Remove anything that's separating us from your love. 
Lord, we, we thank you, Lord God, that you're faithful, Lord God. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that you've given, Lord God, given to each and every believer. Help us to acknowledge, Lord God. Help us to access the power that we have as, as Christians, Lord God. Lord, we just want to say thank you for the opportunity to have a relationship. I thank you for your son, Jesus, Lord God, for being obedient, even unto death on the cross, Lord God, so that we can have and be able to inherit eternal life, not by our works. Lord, but we thank you for the work of, of, of Jesus on the cross. And so I thank you, Lord God, that you're opening the eyes of every believer, the spiritual eyes of every believer, Lord God, so that when we look at situations, as we look at things that happen, Lord, we see you working. And we believe by faith that all things are working together for good. Lord God, I thank you, Lord God, for those who may be here, Lord God, don't have a relationship with you. Help us, Lord God, to know. Help us as Christians, Lord God, to be good reflections of you, Lord God. Lord, it's, it's about relationship with you, Lord God. If there's someone out there who needs, uh, Lord God, a relationship with you, I thank you that you're knocking at the hearts, Lord God. And I thank you that we don't have to be in four walls to receive salvation. I thank you that all we have to do is pray, Lord God, to, co to, to confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. Believe in our hearts that you raised him from the dead and then salvation is ours. Lord God, if there's someone who needs that prayer, who needs a relationship, give them the courage, Lord God, to put a note in the chat box, Lord God, to, to email, to call the church, Lord God, and we'll be glad to walk them through the plan of salvation, the prayer of salvation. And Lord God, for anyone who is in a backslidden condition who is saying, Lord, I want, to get, I want to get closer to you. I want to come back. I want to be better. Lord, I thank you that you're married to the backslider. So Lord God, we thank you how you're blessing our nation even now, even though it doesn't look like it. Lord, we intercede and, and declare, Lord, that you're, God of, you're, you're still God of the United States of America. You're, God of, you're, you're, you're our God. You're God. You're God. And we know, Lord God, that if we humble ourselves, if we seek your face, if we pray, if we turn from our ways, Lord God, we know that you'll hear from heaven. We'll hear from heaven, Lord God, knowing that, that you will forgive us of our sins. And Lord God, that you will heal the land. So we thank you, Lord God, for your great work. Lord God, I pray, Lord God, as we close this prayer, that you bless each and every listener. Lord God, bless them throughout this week. Let them walk this week in power and in might, not based on what the situation looks like, Lord God, but the power that works within them. So we say thank you. We love you. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless each and every one of you. We thank you um, for tuning in with us. God bless you, Strangers Home. God bless you, Brooklyn Chapel. God bless you all who are uh, tuning in with us. God is a great God. He's a mighty God. We simply have to yield to God. Give God the right of way and watch him work. God bless you. We love you. Uh, we have Bible study on Thursday nights at 6 o'clock via Zoom, um, Strangers Home Church. And then on Wednesday night, uh, Brooklyn Chapel, we have Bible study at 615, also via Zoom. Feel free to join us. We'll send the information. Just email us. Um, we also have prayer tomorrow night at 8 o'clock on the conference call line, not the Zoom line, the conference call line. All right. We'll send that information out again, but we'll begin prayer again tomorrow night as we pray and see God's face even in these times. Um, um, so so please, please, please join in with prayer on tomorrow night. Um, this is for all churches. This is this is not one church or the other. This is uh, I'm so glad that I, that I pastor two churches uh, serving one God. Amen. So uh, prayer starting tomorrow night. Bible study Tuesday night at six o'clock. Bible study Wednesday night at at, at eight. Uh, I'm sorry, 6.15. Amen. God bless you. Um, uh, be blessed. Have a great week. And we love you. Amen.